All right, good morning. Good morning. Well, happy Easter, here it is. Um, on uh, Friday, Good Friday, uh, we had a service where we talked about Passover and Good Friday. You know, uh, Jesus and the disciples went to Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover. So uh, we, uh, our way of making Good Friday, Good Friday was during the day on Friday, and many of you were involved. We fed some people in uh, a park in North Hollywood. Uh, we had a beautiful lunch for about 50, 60 people there, and then after that we packed up the rest of the food and went downtown and fed another 50 people there. So if you brought us food or you came to serve or you were involved in any way, we are very, very grateful. I know it doesn't solve the problem of homelessness, uh, but, but it did make Friday a good Friday for a bunch of people who were hungry, which counts to me. In my book, I think that's absolutely significant and, um, and it's, it's something. Um, so here we are, Easter. Wow, I love Easter. I always loved Easter as a kid. Um, years ago, I was here, as, uh, here at this church as the minister, and we had a woman who was in charge of junior church, and she was what I think of as kind of a granola kind of mom. And I mean that with absolute love. I loved her dearly. She was wonderful. She did a great job for us. But she convinced me that we needed to have all real eggs for Easter Sunday. And so we were, um, we dyed eggs. It seemed like we were dying eggs for days. We dyed over a thousand eggs. Do you know how long that takes? It's because you put about three in a bowl at a time. It took forever. And um, because, you know, she said, oh, no, it's got to be natural. We can't have anything that's pre-produced. It's got to be healthy. It's all this. Okay, okay, good. So we put all those eggs out there on the lawn while the kids are in the first service. And um, and something interesting happened. One of those big Southern California crows came and started pecking at the eggs, which very quickly started to look not like pretty little pastel eggs, but looked like little piles of egg salad. And, um, and that crow had friends. And once they heard the buffet was open, about 50 crow friends showed up all over the lawn and started pecking at all the eggs everywhere. So now the lawn is covered in egg salad. And um, uh, not, never one to say I told you so, but I knew this, you know, first of all, kids don't want a hard boiled egg, okay? <laughs> there is nothing fun about a hard boiled egg for a kid. Uh, maybe if you were Bobby Flay or something like that as a kid, Bobby Flay might have gotten a hard boiled egg and done something with it. He's on the Food Channel if you don't know. And, uh, but for a normal kid, a hard-boiled egg is really not high on their list of things. Um, now, having been a Boy Scout, I'm, I try to always be prepared. So it just so happens that I had a drawer full of chocolate-covered eggs in my desk. And so very quickly, we went out and we scraped up all the uh, egg salad all over the lawn. We tried to pick that up as much as we possibly could, and we just threw eggs everywhere, chocolate-covered foil chocolate-covered, processed, sugar-filled eggs. We threw everywhere, all over, and Easter was saved. It, was, it turned out to be really, really good. So just so you know, just so you know, if you have children or grandchildren, they might eat an egg occasionally, but on Easter, that is not what they want. They want the hollow bunny experience. They do. <laughs> they want a chocolate bunny that's sweet and empty, and delicious and probably has minimal nutritional value. Okay. Uh, when I first received the call, so I have one other little Easter story I'll share. When I first knew that I was going to become a minister, I decided, gee, I should probably teach Sunday school. I had done that in, in my church growing up, but not in a New Thought church at all. So I, I got connected up with a guy in La Crescenta, Bill Shermer, a wonderful man. He had a little church there, and I did their Sunday school. And I had everything from the teenagers to the babies. And so I decided we'd do an Easter egg hunt, and this was really good. And so for a couple of weeks, I was filling eggs at home at night while I was, you know, watching TV. I'm filling eggs, filling eggs. And um, all of a sudden, I realized I, I had probably consumed about a third of the chocolate myself. <laughs> and I was out of stuff to put in the eggs. So I was looking around, and what am I going to do? What am I going to do? And I noticed I had, like, a, a few rolls of quarters on the dresser. So I thought, I'll put a couple of quarters in each of these other eggs. This will be great. Kids will love that, right? 
So we did, and, we, and I put the eggs out there. We have the Easter egg hunt, and Easter egg hunt is going along swimmingly with all these beautiful little kids up in the hills of La Crescenta. Right up until one kid opened an egg and found that there was money. And he screamed out, there's money in some of these eggs! <laughs> and pandemonium broke out. <laughs> little kids went flying out of the way, bigger kids were trying to get to the egg. So, so I realized at that point that um, <coughs> perhaps money in the eggs is maybe not the best thing if you have a large group of kids uh, covering territory. So now on to Easter today. Here we are. Um, you know, Jesus gave this teaching that's very important for us in the science of mind, and it was this, that it's done unto you as you believe. If you see yourself as little or small or not much in any way, that will be your experience. That's what the universe will give back to you. But if you see yourself as capable and lovable, and I can do it, then that's what life will do back to you because life is all about corresponding. Life responds by corresponding. So I know what we're thinking is, how can I see my life as blessed when I have so many challenges before me? And I know people have challenges. We live in a time when people have lots of stuff going on. And so, um, we look and say, gee, there are so many things that are not the way I want them to be. Uh, but be is the key word here. I think it's about being more than it's about doing. You know, who we are as a being is so much greater than the circumstances, than the conditions that we face at any given moment in our life. What we've been focusing on so often has been the error, the sickness, the lack, the upset, rather than giving our attention to the divine. And this is what science of mind is all about is about giving our attention to the divine, and those other things seem to have a way of taking care of themselves. So you know, at, sick, uh, at Christmas, our understanding is that through the power of God that is within us, we give birth to our divine self. Right? In religious science, we call this the Christ. It is potential in everyone, just waiting to be called forth into expression. Now, Jesus is an important uh, as a teacher because he realized demonstrated and lived from this place, this consciousness of the Christ. So he is a model for us. There is as much Christ in you as there was in Jesus. We believe that. The difference is he lived from it. We have moments. We have times where we do pretty well and then not so well again and again. So again, I want to say that Christ is the awareness that we are one with God. The enlightened or Christ mind lives fully from this awareness of I'm one with God. And the way that expresses that that, it get, that gets expressed through an ongoing energy of unconditional love. So there are many Christed beings. There have been many Christed beings throughout history in different traditions. It doesn't make any of them less that they are not the only one. It's very limited human thinking, I think, to think that there could only be one. It's the same error thinking that says, you know, this, this couldn't really apply to us. You know, who do we think we are anyway? So for Easter, we recognize this, this self within us is the power of the universe, the self is the love of God, the I am presence, and it exists in every man, woman, and child. Now, this is a tremendously powerful realization. You know, we are not at the effect of the lovelessness in ourselves or the lovelessness of other people. You know, and you don't have to look far to see that there is seemingly a lot of lovelessness in the world. We see that lovelessness and we participate in a way that transmutes it. We add our prayer, we add our affirmation, we add our loving energy, we add our positive thought, we add healing into the equation of the universe because there's never been a time where the light does not cast out the darkness. You know, the darkness has no power in and of itself. The darkness doesn't argue with the light. So when we see difficulty, our job always is to be the light. Our job is to be the light, to know the light, to shine the light, to believe in the light, and know that the darkness in and of itself is not a power, it is not real. So, you know, this, um, uh, if you've been watching the news at all this week, uh, on Friday we talked about the burning bush, that Moses has a face-to-face -face encounter with God through the burning bush. Well, one of the burning bushes that we experienced uh, recently was the, the fire at Notre Dame in France, which was heartbreaking for so many people. You know, no... Everything in France is measured from Notre Dame being the central point. This is such a big thing in the French culture. It's a huge part of Easter. It's, it's, it's everything in the French culture. You know, and then also consider that in, in our own country, that three southern churches were all uh, burned. And, um, and so if you think that there is not lovelessness in the world, we don't have to look far. But also the solution to that is also very nearby. 
The solution is right where we are. You know, the message of science of mind is that we do not to do, do anything we don't have to do something to see our individual selves as healed. We don't need to wait to see ourselves as whole or perfect and complete, like Ernest says in the textbook. We are that right now, regardless of any external circumstances. And it becomes our job to know that for the world that we live in, for these churches down south, for the people who are affected by the loss of Notre Dame and the fire they had there. You know, God never says, oh, gee, I can't do anything about that right now. Uh, get back to me later. I need a little more time. I got to figure this out. You know, so, so here's this teaching that is very important to us that Jesus gave that the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And this is important for us at Easter as it is every time of year because this means that, that this is a state of consciousness that is available to all of us. So in the history of, of religion in the world and, and certainly in New Thought history in America, Starting with Mary Baker Eddy in the 1800s, and then on to the Fillmores in Unity, Emma Curtis Hopkins also in the 1800s, Ernest Holmes in the early 1900s, all of these people realized that Jesus was the great example, not the exception. That what Jesus was, we had in potential within us. Up until this point, people thought that Jesus was special, but they themselves were nothing very much. And that if you had difficulty in life, well, face it, people didn't, 150 years ago, people didn't live very long, did they? You know, people just didn't live a long life 150 years ago. And for most people, for most people, life was really difficult. It, yeah, if you were the king, it was great. But if you were anybody else, it wasn't so good, right? So life was difficult and people didn't live very long. And so the promise of a when you die, you get to have a heavenly experience and all your troubles are washed away, that was very, very attractive to people. They say, well, yes, this life I suffer a lot, but at least when I die, it will all get better. So my point about the New Thought founders was what they said is you don't have to die for it to get better. You know, your life can be heaven here. You know, you can have healed conditions. You can have a healthy body. You can have loving relationships. You can have uh, an abundant supply of everything you need. You can be creatively expressed. That's available now. You don't have to die to get there. And that was a huge revelation. And I'm going to say most people are not on board with that. Most people still think it's going to get better when they die. And good luck, I say with that. Um, because Why do I say that? Well, I don't say that to be a butthead, excuse me, but I say... I. <laughs> I don't, because you know, the, problem, the thing is, you take you with you, right? You take you with you. It's like that woman I met in Hawaii years ago, and I asked her how she liked living in paradise, and she said to me, she said, well, you know, she, she was from the Inland Empire. She lived out in Riverside County. And she said to me, she said, well, you know, when I was back on the mainland, I worked three jobs, and I fought every day with my grown daughter, and, and I was fighting with my ex-husband all the time, and then I moved to paradise. And I said, yeah, so how do you find life in paradise? And she said, well, I'm still working three jobs. I fight every day long distance with my daughter, and I'm still fighting with my ex-husband. And, and I said, wow, that's, that's really surprising. And she says, yeah, what I came to realize is I moved to paradise, but I didn't bring any paradise with me. Right? It's like, oh, another example of everywhere we go, there we are. You know, so when you leave this earthly plane, you're going with you. Right? So this is why, but this is important. This is why we want to clean it up now. This is why we want to take care of stuff now. Ernest Holmes says in the textbook, and I do not say this to disappoint or depress anybody, but he says you take your personality with you. Yeah, your personality. So you know that snarky little part? That's going with you. It's part of the journey, which is why we need to heal it now. So anyway, the kingdom of heaven is available. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. I wonder if we're available to it. Right? See, it's, it's the consciousness of love. You know, it's the consciousness of all needs met. I don't know what heaven is to you, but my idea of heaven is really good. When I was a kid, I thought that heaven was laying around on a cloud. You know, I think that's what kids think. There's something like that, that heaven is laying around in a cloud. But I think, no, that's not what heaven is now. Heaven is, is uh, peaceful conditions, a healthy body, having love in our life, having our needs met, being able to enjoy the moment and who we're with. So heaven is inside of us. And it is to be experienced here and now. Now, having said that, if it were an external thing, well, I'll just tell you this story. A very kind and very righteous woman goes to heaven. 
And, uh, and she meets St. Peter, and St. Peter says to her, well, before you can pass through the gates and live in paradise, um, we have a little test for you. And you just, you just got to spell a word. And she says, okay, okay, I, I was always pretty good at spelling. Tell me, tell me the word. And she, he says, oh, it's love. And she says, oh, that's easy, L-O-V-E. And he says, oh, welcome, welcome to the kingdom of heaven. Welcome to paradise. Um, and, and, and he gets a text. St. Peter gets a text, and he says, oh, i got to go to the head office. The boss needs me right away. Would, would you mind watching the gate for a minute while I go and take care of this? You know, when, when he calls, we answer. And, uh, and so she says, yeah, yeah, sure. And he says, so you know what to do. If anybody comes through, you have them spell a word, and then you welcome them into the kingdom. Okay, okay, okay. So, so, so St. Peter runs off to have a little visit with God. And the woman is at the gate, and she's got St. Peter's clipboard and the pen, and, and so she's waiting, and some people come in, and she has them spell a word, love, or peace, or joy, or, and welcome, welcome to the kingdom, welcome to the kingdom. Well, before long, who should show up but her long-ago ex-husband? And is she surprised to see him? She says, oh my gosh, I'm so surprised to see you here. And he says, well, and I you, and what are you doing here? And she says, oh, I'm just helping St. Peter for a few minutes. Um, and uh, so welcome to heaven. Oh, but before you come in, you have to spell a word. Oh, okay, what word do you want me to spell? She says, oh, it's nothing, it's easy, it's simple. We're so glad to welcome you here. Well, what's the word? No, no, it's nothing, it's nothing. You know, you're going to really love it here. It's beautiful and blah, blah, blah. Okay, all right, the word, the word. Um, he, she says, yes, oh, let me see here, let me see here. And she flips through her clipboard and she goes, oh, here it is right here, Czechoslovakia. Uh, what keeps us out of the kingdom, you know? What keeps us out of the kingdom? I think what keeps us out of the kingdom is a lack of love, you know, that everybody has a reason to justify why we don't have to be loving. You know, the lack of love that I give to the world is what keeps me out of the kingdom. If you think you're giving plenty, then you must be in heaven right now. And if you're not in heaven right now, that means you get to be a little more loving in the world. You know, I, I, I think we get to use the circumstances of our life. This is probably what everybody does, is, you know, the circumstances of our life, we use them and we hold on to them to stay crucified, you know, to stay separate from God. I use the events, the things that happen, I give them power and make them real and believe in them so I can stay in the hell of my own mind. And I don't know about you, but I've been very successful at creating a real hell right here. I don't have to go far for hell, which is why it's so encouraging to me personally that I don't have to go far for heaven either. If you are being busy right now in your life, stuck on the cross, you know, everyone will understand that this is why we are not able to resurrect. If we're so attached to the crucifixion, there's no resurrection there. But please understand, this is an energy pattern. Crucifixion always happens before resurrection. And so I don't know where you're experiencing crucifixion in your life right now, but I suspect you are because it seems to be part of our human condition. But I know if you're experiencing crucifixion, it's also absolutely possible for you to feel resurrection. Sometimes we feel crucified in a relationship. Sometimes we feel crucified in a job. Sometimes we feel crucified at home. You know, but resurrection is available. Mm -hmm. uh, I, metaphysically, crucifixion, I believe, symbolizes crossing out all of the errors of mortal consciousness and making way for the Christ to come forth by means of us, right? The divine self within us. It's always been there. It just seems hidden, you know, but it's only limited. It's only restricted by our belief. So Jesus said, I have overcome the world. I have learned a new way to be. And I think that this is what resurrection is, the bottom line, is that we learn a new way to be. Look, if we look at life on earth, the way we have been being is not sustainable. You know, the way we have been being, the way we have been treating each other, like we're all separate, like we're not all children in the same family of God, that is not a sustainable way of being. So we have to come up with another way. Mm -hmm. that we have to learn a new way to be. I think Jesus' two main points are as relevant for us today as they were then. And his two main points were to love God and love your neighbor as yourself. And I think sometimes we fall short on both of those things. You know, to, to, do, this, uh, to, to do this, a certain degree of spiritual understanding and development, I think, are really, really necessary. We have to learn a new way to be because so much is not as it should be on the, in the world that we live in right now. Maybe it's not as it should be 
in our home as well. It might not be as it should be in our family or with people we care very much about. You know, do you think that it's the norm to have relationships be, be hostile or do you think it's the norm that you have to be depressed or insecure or miserable or possessive or any of that? that you know, there's not a lot of God being expressed in those particular energies. You know, it's like a, those, those are like a dial of prayer for atheists, right? You know, the atheist calls the dial of prayer number and nobody answers. That's dial of prayer for an atheist, right? <laughs> You know, we've been trained, I think, again and again that our feelings have control over us, but you know, people have control over their feelings, you know? We are not under, uh, we are not under the control of our, we have feelings, feelings don't have us, right? So what we want to learn to do is to take a breath, you know, to step back, take a breath and think, who do I want to be in this situation? How do I want to respond rather than right off the cuff, react, react, react? Because when we react, I think we get ourselves in deeper. Right? That you have the choice. You have the power. God has given us free will and God has given us choice. So if we don't like the choices that we've been making, make some new ones. Right? So between the crucifixion and the resurrection, there is a period of time. And this is part of that energy pattern. Between the crucifixion and the resurrection, there's three days or three weeks or three years between when we experience that crucifixion in our life and we resurrect to a new and better experience. And so I think that to get out of the tomb, there are several things that we need to do. And the first is we need to surrender. You know, I don't know, but I know that there's a power greater than me that is within me that does know. So humanly, I may not know how to get out of the tomb. Humanly, I may not know how to resurrect, but I certainly believe that the principle and the power of God within me, within you, knows exactly what needs to happen for us to have resurrection in our life. So surrender is the first one. The second one is listen. You know, they say God gave us two ears and one mouth because we're supposed to listen twice as much as we talk. By all rights, I should have about five mouths and one ear. Um, I, I, again and again in my life, I have come to times where I've completely lost my voice for no good reason, and I realize it's because God is always saying to me, I'm trying to get you to listen, but you won't shut up. And so when my voice goes away, I have no choice. And uh, so... So, you know, and there's a line in the Bible that says, Speak, Lord, thy servant heareth. And this is be still. We have to be still to listen to the wisdom of God that is already within us. So surrender, listen, and number three is serve. I think this is essential. You know, one of the greatest things we can do as an individual to move our life forward is to put some of our energy into serving someone or something else. One of the greatest ways you can have your own prayer answered is to pray for somebody else who has a similar prayer or a similar challenge that they are dealing with, right? So when we're talking about being of service, we're here to serve God's will, God's plan. And what is it? Well, what's right in front of you? You know, who are the people in front of you? Are you serving them? Are you serving those situations? You know, God is always for a fuller and greater expression of life, and that happens by us often, I think, rolling up our sleeves. You know, so I think resurrection is lifting ourselves, spirit, mind, and body, into this greater consciousness that we call the Christ consciousness. You know, when we rise, it's, it's without any of the victim stuff. You know, you can't hold on to your past and rise to a new life. You can't blame or shame or regret your way into healing. All of that has to be left behind. There's a story that we tell. It's time to let that story go if you want to have a new, better, different life. Because you can't be both risen and in the past at the same time. Something's got to go. You know, we say, well, people will say, well, but it's so much work. And it's like, well, yeah, I know it's work. But you know, a drowning man doesn't complain about the size of his life preserver, does he? He's just happy to have something to hold on to. And in the science of mind, we have a lot to hold on to. We have a lot that will keep us afloat. You know, when people ask about the meaning of Easter, and I say, well, you know, one thing I believe about the meaning of Easter is that when Jesus appears to his disciples after the crucifixion, after the resurrection, Jesus appears to his disciples to say, hey, look, I told you, you are not just a body. You are spirit. You are consciousness. And the consciousness that you are continues on even when you set this earthly vessel aside. This is not the end of the story. 
And I want us to know, all of us today, that what's happening in our life right now is not the end of the story. It's not over till it's over, and God within us knows exactly what we need to know and do and be for the story to have the best possible ending. Let's pray. Thank you. So we turn our attention inward for a moment and recognize this Spirit of God, this Christ presence, is the truth about each and every one of us here. That Christ is not limited to a denomination or a person or any location at all. That Christ is the truth of who and what we are. And so in this awareness of our connection with God, I further know we are all connected with each other on the unseen side of life. There is only one of us here. We are all cells in the body of God. And so in this awareness, I speak the word for us that wherever we have had personal crucifixion in our life, we may be in it right now, I speak the word for us that healing is available, that we are choosing consciously with a full heart to be resurrected. And this means that anything that does not serve us, we willingly let it go. We release thoughts and beliefs and ideas and habit patterns and ways of being. We release an old story and we make room to have newness in our life like we have never known before. I'm certain that with God, all things are possible. So I claim a personal resurrection for each and every one of us. And we include in our prayer today our family members and friends, parents and children, all of those that we hold near and dear. And I know that right where they are, the fullness, the allness of God's spirit is right there. We let our prayer be a blessing in the world that we live in. So all those things that pull at our attention, whether it's the churches down south or Notre Dame in France, and everything else that's happening in the world that we live in, we affirm God's perfect healing presence is right there. Beyond the story, beyond the drama, beyond the difficulty, God is there as love, as people caring, as healing, as right outcome. We bless our church, we bless all churches. We bless synagogues and temples and mosques and ashrams, all paths to God. And I know we're blessed by being together, that there is raising up for every one of us. And so with a full heart, I say thank you, God, that this is so, that this is the truth right here, right now. I release this word, and so it is. Together we all say, Amen.